Good evening. So, tells you a lot about me that my favorite quote about being a doer is a Muppet who talked to Luke Skywalker on the planet Dagobah back in 1980. Do or do not, there is no try. We're talking about uh, being a doer today of the Word. If you would turn to James chapter 2, we're going to be there in just a minute. We're talking about working our faith, about how we can make our faith vital, about what the uh, repercussions of having an active, vibrant, living faith. And we're going to start out in James chapter 2. But before we get too far, I did want to uh, just point out that we've been through our Involvement Sunday where we passed out the papers where we had people go around and uh, sign up for the different areas of work where you could volunteer, where you wanted to be actively involved. And I do understand that I am preaching to uh, the congregation that is typically here on Sunday night. So in a sense, this is very much preaching to the choir because most of us are involved. Most of us are doing. Most of us are actively engaged in the things that are going on here at Keller. But hopefully uh, you can use this as a little bit of encouragement to continue to be involved, to maybe get more involved, maybe some activities where you haven't ever thought about being involved before, that you can engage with the congregation here. In James chapter 2, starting in verse 14, the writer says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. When I was in college, I was at Abilene Christian University, and I took a spring break campaign uh, one spring to St. Louis to work with a gentleman named Stanley Ship. Stanley was involved in a lot of uh, inner, inner city kind of missionary type stuff. And I found myself engaged in some benevolence work one Saturday morning. And we walked up to a brownstone, uh, kind of nondescript, inner city, kind of run down, abode, home, dwelling. And there was a lady in there. Her name was Phyllis. I can't remember exactly how many kids had, but it wasn't one or two. She had three, four people living with her. Uh, and as you walked up to the door, there was a smell that came from the inside that was sewage. It was bad. And as we got inside and we met Phyllis and we started delivering the groceries that we had brought, uh, we were there to help her. We were there to give her food. We were there to engage with her. We were there to lift her up, to encourage her. And as I began to play with some of the kids, you know, I, maybe it's my mental level, even at 50, I still enjoy kids a lot more than I enjoy adults. It's just the way I'm built. And, and as I began to play with the kids, I, I began to realize that, you know, these, these kids are happy. These kids are content. They don't, they don't know that they don't have stuff. They don't know that they're want. They don't know that they're in need. And, and they took me around, showed me part of the, the dwelling, and we went downstairs and downstairs was in two feet of water. The pipes that take the wastewater from the kitchen, from the toilets, from the showers, just all emptied into the basement. That's where they were living. She was living on food stamps. She was destitute. She was happy. She had had her door knocked on by the congregation some months prior and had been immersed into Christ, had come to know Jesus, had engaged with the congregation, and she's just living her life the best she knew how to live. And I sat there and we played with the kids and we delivered our groceries and, and I left there thinking, mm, we did some good. We really did something good. Well, the next morning was Sunday. And Sunday morning I arrived at the congregation uh, in my suit and tie and marched down to the front, you know, where all the young people march when we're on a mission trip from 
Abilene Christians of the inner city of St. Louis. And lo and behold, there was Phyllis with her kids right on that second row. And she had, she had bags with her, grocery bags. And she took these grocery bags and she set them on the front pew. So I started asking, what to, what's Phyllis doing? Oh, that's her contribution. I was like, wait. She's bringing back the stuff we took her yesterday? Like, well, no, it might not be that. It might be stuff that she got on her food stamps. It might be some of the stuff that she had left over. We don't know what it is, but she feels like she, there are people in the world that are worse off than her. And she wants to help them. And so every week, we take her the stuff on Saturday, and every Sunday she's here and she gives a little bit back to the work of the church. And this verse pops into my mind. Every, every time I think about this verse, I think about Phyllis. She was happy. She was raising her kids. Kids didn't know any better. And what she was teaching them is that no matter how little we have, no matter how destitute it seems that we are, we have something that we can do for somebody else that needs it more than we do. James 2. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Skip on down to verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. You know, in between the two parts that I just read, uh, James actually talks about Abraham, right? And Abraham and in his life and all the things that he did and how he was justified by faith and how his works completed his faith and how the things that he did exuded his faith. And it's, it's confusing. As a matter of fact, a lot of people, Martin Luther included, wanted actually James removed from the canon of Scripture because he really disagrees with some of the things that Paul seems to write back in Acts. And we'll get to that in a minute. But I want you to think about Abraham for a minute. How do you know Abraham was faithful? It's because of the things that he did, right? He offered Isaac, knowing that God would provide. That if, in fact, Isaac died, that God would raise him from the dead to complete the promise that he had given him. We studied this morning in George's class in here, and I know we did in some of the other classes, have either studied this morning or previously Hebrews chapter 11, right? The, the chapter of faith, the hall of faith, all the people in Hebrews chapter 11 that are seen as faithful. And I want you to think about them for a minute. What'd they do? What'd Noah do? He built an ark and he preached for 120 years. What did Moses do? He was a deliverer. He was a redeemer. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, all of these people, David, Daniel, all of the people that are heroes of the faith that we learn about in Hebrews chapter 11, all of them, they were all doers. Now, what's interesting is a lot of people kind of get backwards about faith and works, and we'll get to that in a minute, but they weren't doers to become saved, right? They weren't doers to become part of the church. They weren't doers to become part of God's family. They were doers because they were part of God's family. They were doers because they had been saved. They were doers because their sins had been forgiven, right? They were doers because of the hope that they had in them. Turn real quick over to Romans chapter 4. For if Abraham was justified by works, verse 2, he has something to boast about, but not for before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Skip down to verse 18. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which is as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's tomb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith 
as he gave God the glory, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham was not saved by the things that he did. Abraham was not saved by the actions that he took. Abraham was not saved because of the things in his life that he performed. Abraham was saved by his faith because he was saved. He did things that are unbelievable. He did things that are uncanny. He did things that are hard for us to even fathom, even at a hundred considered the promise of God fulfilled, true, complete. Real quick, turn to Matthew 25. We don't have a lot of time to spend here, but I do think that it really kind of hits home with what we're talking about. In Matthew 25, Jesus is talking here. He is actually trying to explain what the end of time will be. Right? Look at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all of the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations. He's going to separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation of the world, from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry. Listen. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we do that? When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when, when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? Skip down to verse 41 real quick. And he's going to say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry. Listen. I was hungry. You gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger, or naked or sick or in prison, and did not minister to you? And his answer to both of them is the same. Truly I say to you, when you did it to the least of these, Talking to the people on his right, he did it to me. And when you did not do it to the least of these, talking to the people on his left, you did not do it to me. These two groups are very similar. These two groups are not surprised to be in front of God. They are not surprised that God exists. They are not surprised about anything other than they even seem to both be willing to engage in activity that would, we would consider benevolent, right? Charitable. They seem willing, right? The ones who didn't do it say, well, I'm confused. If, if I had seen you thirsty or if I had seen you hungry, surely I would have done something. The other ones are equally confused. What's the difference? In these two groups, what's the difference? One group was busy doing, and one group did not do. I want to let that sink in for a minute. One group, the group that will inherit eternal life, the sheep, called blessed by the Father. The other group, cursed, condemned for all of eternity. And it seems to be from this passage, the difference is, in what they did or did not do. You know, Romans 12, 1 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, a lot of times I think we walk through life and think that the things that we don't do are going to get us to heaven. I don't drink, I don't cuss, I don't do drugs, I don't, I'm not mean to people, I don't charge you serious interest, I don't cheat on my taxes. 
And yet the more you read, the more it becomes clear. It's not about just the abstaining of the things that we're supposed to abstain from, right? It's just not about avoiding evil. It's about engaging in good. Right? It's about doing things that are good. It's about doing things that are the fruit of our faith. Right? That because we are saved, that because we are faithful, that because we have been added to the church, we have things to get busy doing. And it leads to a lot of confusion. You know, a lot of people read these passages and think, okay, so I have to do things to become saved. That's not what I'm saying at all. It's not what James is saying. It's not what Paul is saying. It's not what the Bible teaches. Your works, the things that you do, and the things that we have done, you can't do enough. A lot of times I heard it said that you can't do anything to get to heaven. The truth is you can't do enough. Even if you did everything that you could, you can't do enough because we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's glory. But what Scripture teaches is a little different. That your faith produces salvation. Confess, repent, be immersed into Christ, be raised to walk in newness of life, as we saw this morning happen to a young lady. And that salvation produces the works. We are saved. We are the church. We are righteous. We have been sanctified, justified. We have been made perfect through the blood of Christ that flows over us and forgives us and washes us and cleanses us of our sin. And the result of that is supposed to produce things that are visible, right? Go back to Hebrews chapter 11. What did the saved do? They offered up their son. They built a boat that saved humanity. They engaged in true worship. They were sawn in two. They were martyred. They were killed. They never betrayed Christ. People of whom the world is not worthy. That's the kind of people we're to be. That's the kind of people we are supposed to be in this world. The kind of people who produce these actions and these acts and these deeds not to become saved, not to become righteous, not to become justified, but because we are justified and sanctified and righteous and saved. We are to be the kind of people who do things that are good in the world. It's hard though, isn't it? There's a lot of reasons why doing things is hard. If I don't do anything, maybe people won't criticize me. Maybe I won't upset anybody. Maybe I won't do anything to hurt somebody. If I get busy doing stuff, I kind of become a lightning rod, don't I? Kind of put myself out there. I can get frustrated. I plan things. People don't come to it. I engage in things and people don't respond. I teach people and they don't listen to what Jesus has to say. It's hard. It's scary. It's painful. But it is, according to James 2, how you test your faith. Because what really is the purpose of James 2? The purpose of James 2 really is to produce in you, to encourage you, to try to evoke a response of the people that are reading James, right? Of this Christian that's busy doing stuff. Turn to Romans 12. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affliction, affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do 
what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, listen, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, there's so many things that we can busy ourselves doing. So many things you can fill your life with, right? Social media, Facebook, Instagram, all the, I don't even know them all, all the different things that we can spend time sorting through, looking at, and some of it keeps us connected. But when was the last time you sat down with somebody that really needed to talk? When was the last time you sat down with a person who needed food? A person who needed drink? When was the last time you sat down with your enemy? You know, nobody ever promised us that being the kind of people, the kind of men and women that God wanted us to be was going to be easy. Matter of fact, Jesus very specifically says the opposite. It's not going to be easy at all. It's going to be hard. It's going to divide families. It's going to be persecutorial. There's going to be tribulation. There's going to be trouble. And it's going to be in those times and in those trials and in those rough times where you are tested and refined by fire and made strong. If you're anything like me, there's been times in your life where you just kind of have woken up one morning and thought, and everything just seems really sorry. <laughs> it's just not good. I'm depressed about something, or somebody's mad at me about something, or something's not going the way that it ought to be. And you know what 100% of the time I realize is going on? Every single time, you know what's happening? I have become idle. I've quit moving forward. I've quit trying to be charitable. I've quit making sure that I'm helping needy. I've quit being benevolent. I've quit being the kind of person that is out doing something. So often when we run out of things to do, we get busy doing the wrong stuff. It's just as bad to not be busy doing anything at all. We have to get engaged. We have to get going. We have to get moving. We have to become the kind of people that are out affecting the world for good because that is what God wants us to be. And if you are that, keep doing it. There's an ebb and a flow to life and at some point you're going to kind of feel like the ceiling you know, is as high as it's going to go, as high as the prayers are going to get and you're not going to be able to re-engage and you don't even know that God is hearing what you're putting out there. You, you just start to feel alone. You start to feel a little bit down. You start to feel a little bit discouraged. And what I submit to you is you need to get busy, right? You need to get busy. We need to get busy doing something. It's far more often the case that we are lackadaisical or lazy or not busy that we get down and depressed than it is that we're burnt out. Now, burnout's a real thing. Don't get me wrong. I've never done it myself, but I've seen people do it. And it's a real thing, and that's hard. But if you are alone, if you are depressed, if you are discouraged, if you are finding a hard time finding the value in what's going on in your life, get busy helping somebody else. That's where we find the solution. You know, so often I talk to people who have been hurt by somebody at church. And what's the first thing they want to do? Leave. Leave. You know what you can't find any place but in your spiritual family, the church? Peace. Just can't find that in the world. You can't find that out there. You can't find that any place but in here. Now what's really sad is that in here you're going to find some pain that you're not going to find anywhere else. <laughs> you really will. It's not easy. But it is worth it. Matthew 25.
get busy doing. Because if nothing else, what I know about the end of time is, there's going to be two groups. And you may be willing to do something. You may be willing to be engaged. You may be willing to feed and give drink and visit. But if you're not, how do you know that you're not part of that group on the left? Here in particular, we have a lot of needs. As I mentioned, we uh, have just been through Involvement Sunday. We just have passed out a big long list of things that people can be involved in. Some of you are very involved in that. We saw some of the fruits of that this morning, right? Uh, Christy putting on Christ in baptism was a direct result of our women's prison ministry, and that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And not everything we are going to engage in is going to reduce in fruits like that. Not everything. But there's plenty to be involved in. There's plenty to get doing. There's plenty to get done. There's plenty to keep, you, keep us busy. There's plenty for all of us to be involved in. And this is just some of it. But I want to go back and read Matthew 25 again. And I want you to think about something Real quick, look at Matthew 25. And as we go through this list of things that these people were busy doing, think about the things that we do here that you can get engaged in that do this. Verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. This Tuesday... This was not a plug for Tuesday morning, by the way. It's just God's way of working out His providence. This Tuesday at 10 a.m., you've got an opportunity to feed and to give drink to people that need it. Vicki has been diligently sorting through a list of people, and we have some 25 families that we're going to help this week. I know there's a lot of other stuff that goes on. There's work, and there's family, and there's holidays, and there's a lot of stuff. And you do not have to be involved Tuesday morning if you are unable to, especially if you have something else going on where you're helping somebody else. But if you are looking for something to do to help somebody else who needs food and drink Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Where would that take place? Right here on a Sunday morning? Right here in our Bible classes? Whenever you go to the bank? Every single person that you will ever talk to about Jesus Christ at some point in your life you have introduced yourself to. That's just the way it works. Stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Whether you are male or female, we have a prison ministry that you can be involved in. We go every Sunday into the prisons here locally and we teach people the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not a thing everybody can do. That's a hard thing. Not everybody's qualified to do it because they won't just let anybody into those prisons. I don't think they would let me into those prisons. They might not ever let me out. Maybe they would let me in. Maybe they wouldn't let me out. But it's an opportunity for us to sit with people and to talk to them about Jesus. And to teach them the gospel. And without even thinking about it, I don't know how many people we've studied with, but there's already been two young ladies that have been on Christ in baptism as a result of that. I was up here talking to Vicki and Jeannie this morning after the baptism, and they were talking about how blessed they were to be involved. You know, what's really under-talked about in these kind of ministries and any kind of thing that you get busy doing is that usually the benefactor, the, the people who benefit the most is you, right? When I went to that inner city and I met Phyllis, it changed me. And really not because of anything I had done. But because of who she was. And because of what she did, I was changed. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? 
When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Corey talks about all the time our encouragement teams. You know what our encouragement teams do every week? Sends out cards to encourage people. Sends out cards to tell people that we're glad that they were here, that we miss them, that we wish they were feeling better, that we're praying for them. Just a way to get involved, to encourage somebody who maybe wasn't able to make it. We call people on the phone just to encourage them to be here. People that we're missing, people that haven't made it, people that have visited with us. And then we go visit. Every week we send out dozens of people to go do visits, house to house, heart to heart, person to person, face to face, just to sit down and engage with people in relationships. Now look at all those things. A lot of them are mission type stuff. WBS, you can teach, you can go on a mission trip, you can be engaged in a lot of other things, but really what we're talking about is souls, right? At the end of the day, what we're talking about is relationships with people and souls. And in the same way that we're talking to each other right now, trying to encourage us to get busy doing, trying to encourage us to get involved, trying to encourage us to wrap all of these things together, we also want to reach out And we want to engage and we want to be involved in people's lives and we want to have relationships with people so that they can understand how Jesus has changed us. Right? Every every single one of these opportunities that we have here local, every single one of the benevolence or the charitable works that Jesus is involved in, that he's encouraging us to get involved in, it's all about leading people to him. It's all about bringing people into a relationship with him. It's all about him engaging with people so that he can change their life where is the peace that passes all understanding in Christ where is the hope of eternal salvation in Christ where is the forgiveness of sin in Christ all of the things that we have in our lives that are wonderful none of them are material all of them are spiritual And all of them we have because we are in Christ Jesus. And every single one of these activities, every single one of these things, it's about being engaged with one another. It's about being engaged with people in our lives. It's about being engaged because their souls are important. Because our soul is important to us. Because our relationship with the Father is one that we want, at the end of time, to be standing in front of Him and for Him to judge us and say, get on my right. You blessed. For when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I started with Yoda. Yoda is literally a Muppet. In a galaxy far, far away that doesn't even actually exist. But if we have the kind of faith that Abraham had, that Moses had, that Isaac had, that Jacob had, that Noah had, if we have the kind of faith that is actionable, we're going to see that happen. You're going to know in your life because you're busy doing things. Going back to Phyllis. That inner city mission trip that I went on when I was a junior in college changed me. And like I said, it didn't change me because I was the kind of person I was supposed to be. I was arrogant, conceited. I was a snot-nosed punk kid. Still am in a lot of ways. That's not funny. It's a little funny. I'm working on it. But what was changing about it wasn't anything that I did to myself. It was what that situation that God inserted me into and how it affected me. And that's just one example. There's been so many examples of times where you think you're doing stuff, you feel like you're beating your head against the wall and nothing is happening, you're just getting frustrated, nobody's responding, the people that you're talking to aren't interested in listening to Jesus, and then you just keep finding that motivation. And then one person 
is interested in talking about Jesus. One person wants to sit down and study the Bible. One person is encouraged by a word that you say. One person is affected by the things that you've done to reach out. One person is benefited in some way to what you had to offer because you know Jesus Christ. It makes all the rest of it worth it. And it motivates you to go to the next time. That's the amazing thing, is that the more you engage and the more you find that it benefits you and the more that you grow and the more that you mature, the more you want to be actively involved in the work of the church. It's a cycle. It's why James in James 2 says, very strongly, I think, faith without works is dead. Just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Don't want dead faith. We want a faith that's alive, it's active, it's dynamic, it's engaging. I want to be involved. I know you want to be involved. There's a lot of opportunities to be involved, and it's not just about involvement. It's not just about connections. It's about relationships. It's about souls. It's about getting closer to the Father. And we want that for everybody. If you haven't been as involved as you wanted, if you haven't been as action-oriented as you maybe should have been, if you have not known Jesus until tonight, and you would like to have a conversation about getting into a relationship with Him, putting Him on in baptism, we would love to have that conversation with you. You'll come forward while we stand and sing. We'll take care of that.